Well, hello and welcome back to Quantum Living Conversations. My name is Deirdre Catlin and uh, we, we're just going to start recording here with Meryl because uh, we already were getting into the back and forth. I'm with uh, Meryl <laughs> Tengen Skull and I have not been in your presence since you've gotten married, so I'm sure I butchered it. A little dyslexia uh, there. Yeah, just, a, just a little bit. Tengen Skull. Tengen Skull. We, we could cut we could cut that out and Meryl T. Right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Meryl T. <laughs> um, I'm super excited because we had we met back in 2001 flying T6s together. You were in the Navy, I was in the Air Force, and uh, we were teaching young pilots how to become military aviators. And um, it, so we knew each other for a while, and then you moved on, cross-commissioned at the Air Force, and started flying U-2s, right. which is amazing. But even before that, you flew the, was it the Seahorse? The uh, Navy C helicopter. S C C yeah, SH-60 SH Bravos. Okay, for the Navy. And so yes. you've, you know, and then you've moved on and uh, retired as a colonel, as an inspector general all the way over in DC, all the big wigs. So you've had an amazing career, but more importantly, you're an amazing person. And it's so fun to finally catch up. And uh, we've been playing phone tag here or, or a LinkedIn tag. And, and just two weeks ago, I had a conversation. It was a two hour conversation. And it's like, let's just put this on a video, record it. And you have so much wisdom to pass on and I kindly, you reflect back to me also that I, I do too with all our experiences. So how would you, I'm going to let you introduce yourself. Okay. Um, first of all, we have a lot of experience. We have like over 40, gosh, we almost have over 40 years of experience between the two, like 45, almost 50 years, like half a century worth of military experience and aviation experience, which is great. It's awesome. Thank you. And for we're still looking me. good. <laughs> We're still looking like, yeah, I, I just had a couple of friends say, hey, Meryl, do you ever age, you know? Right. Someone said the word Nosferatu at one point, like <laughs> I'm draining people's blood. But those are my friends there where we used to play D&D. &D. Um, so <laughs> introducing myself, my name is Meryl Tengestall. Um, You did a great introduction. I was uh, retired back in 2017 with uh, over 23 years four months and 20 days, but who's counting, uh, retired out of the Air Force. Um, half of that, about 10 years of that was Navy aviation experience and the other 13 plus years was uh, Air Force uh, aviation experience. So I've had the opportunity to be in both branches of service and fly everything from helicopters, which is low and slow, to uh, U-2s, which is high and slow. So I've uh, hit the gambit all the way to above 70,000 feet. Um, you know, currently I live in uh, the Sacramento area with my husband and my son of seven years old, who is showing me how much of a pain in the butt I was as a child because he mimics me. So there we are. Right. <laughs> Nothing to bring you down to earth than the- Yeah. The yeah, he keeps it real. Yeah. So sorry, all you teachers, anyway. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> um, so I, I actually just want to indulge myself because some of the questions that I've been thinking about is like, what's it like to fly a helicopter on a ship? Okay. So we'll just start so, there. Like what's, all right. what's the Navy like? Yeah. So the reason why I went into helicopters in particular the sh-60 bravo is because i wanted to fly something that had weapons and uh the 60 bravo i selected helicopters out of um corpus christi when i selected and when i went to helicopter training advanced training in pensacola at millington um, when i was looking at the other platforms i knew that i wanted to do the the 60 Bravo. I wanted to do it on the East Coast. Um, I love the fact that they had torpedoes, they had sauna buoys, they had penguin missile, they, uh, you know, the, the air crewman in the back uh, shoots a gun. At that time it was an M60, but I think they upgraded to a Gauss uh, 16 probably. 
um, my information is way dated. So for all you um, attack light helicopters out there, don't crucify me, please, for, <laughs> you know, you know uh, anything I, I say that's wrong. Um, so that's, that's why I went at age 16. I was flying off the back of the boat. Uh, small boats, vice uh, being on the carrier. Uh, I rather, my personal opinion, I'd rather be a uh, big fish in a little pond, whereas, you know, you have one or two helicopters on a small ship with anywhere from 250 to 600 people. Uh, so, you know, your missions are going to vary day to day. So I, I like I liked small boys uh, better. You know, I was uh, on frigates, cruisers, and destroyers. So, you know, my first deployment was on the shotgun cruiser for the GW battle group. So that was, uh, that was exciting. We got to land on a lot of air, a uh, lot of uh, ships. So that's why I enjoyed it. So yeah, that's why I picked, that's why I picked, picked the H60. So is that a deployment that's six months at a time or are you, because you're on a smaller boat, a different mission, it's a smaller deployment schedule? So, so at that time, most deployments were six months and that's not including the workup cycle. So it would be about a year of being on the boat um, with the final deployment being six months. So you'd go out for two weeks and do a workup with the ship, or you'd go out for a month and do some type of uh, joint exercises. And then that would all build up to the point that you went on your uh, long cruise. So for me, because we were on the shotgun cruiser, any time, the GW was out, the cruiser was out, we were on board. So it was just a very, it was good for me in a sense, the first time going, deploying, so I got to see a lot of different operations out there. Mm, cool. Being with, uh, with the carrier. I'm gonna backtrack a little, little bit. How did yeah. you go from Little Merrill to wanting to be, to joining the Navy? Uh, started when uh, I was seven or eight. A lot of people who know me, I don't know if your audience probably doesn't, I watched a lot of sci-fi, in particular Star Trek. And I, at that point, said I was going to be an astronaut. <laughs> and at seven or eight years old, believe it or not, I had a framework in my head on how I was going to make it there. So I knew I was going to begin in math and science. I knew I was going to go to college. And I didn't have it, I didn't, I didn't pretty much figure out, I knew I either had to go commercial aviation or military. But as you get older and you find out that financially, you know, being where I was from, from the Bronx, single parent household, financially, you're not going to get your private license, that the military option is the more economic route. So <laughs> after I, you know, got my degree, um, then I went on to, uh, join the Navy. I figured the Navy, for me, I did a little research and the Navy was the place where, you know, I wanted to have my basis to become uh, hopefully one day future astronaut. So hmm, cool. that was my, my choice. So yeah, I started that journey seven or eight years old. Um, Star Trek is the reason why I, uh, you know, I had this affinity for wanting to be in space, wanting to explore and wanting to, um, be with a group of people that were like-minded in the fact to explore things that were unknown. Are, are you bummed or happy or what are your thoughts about Space Force right now? Is it wow, that's a conversation. That's a, yeah, it's a conversation for another day. Uh, the Space Force, I, I, I think it's an interesting idea to actually execute that uh, with the amount of people we have. Gotcha. Yep. I think I think it's going to be difficult. I mean, how are you going to, you're filling these billets at the highest level. Who's doing all the work? <laughs> Those second lieutenants that just got commissioned from the Air Force Academy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, and how much experience they have. So I, I, um, I think like anything, when you start out, it, it's, it's great to have a framework and maybe in this case, add some more onto that framework. And instead of saying, Hey, let's just, Let's just throw that up on the wall and see how it sticks. Now, some people may look at me and say, we, we thought about this really hard, Meryl, and you don't know what the hell you're talking about. Stay in your IG lane. Yeah, great. <laughs> but looking at this from a, just from a common sense approach. 
<laughs> right? <laughs> that's, all, uh, that's all I'll say there. <laughs> nice. Um, so as, as you deployed, how did you like the lifestyle? I mean, I kind of look at it in hindsight when I, you're young and you're just going out into the world. Like I was just happy to be included deploying to the desert for the first time, not realizing everyone else is like, I'm not going again. You know, I'm young and naive and a little bit, I don't know, ready to go. Um, but if you're getting ready for a year to go six months deployment, how, how was that lifestyle? How did you like that? I, I think when you, when you typically start out, I mean, most pilots when they're new, they're either newly married or they're single. So for me, I mean, I had a cat. So I was uh, <laughs> single, I was ready to, I was excited. I mean, it's an adventure, right? Mm -hmm. So for me, I didn't care how many times I had to deploy. I mean, I had the, there's nothing else I'm doing. So I get to fly, I get a, as much flying time. I get experience. I get to be on the, I get to be on the boat with, or I get to be on the ship. I get to do a mission. The, what more can you ask for when you're, you know, 20 at that time, maybe 24, 25, 26 years old, you're, you're living a life. You're, you're not making a whole heck of a lot, but you're doing so. I was doing something that I dreamed about and I was doing that journey. Oh, kitty. And, uh, and uh, I was very, yeah, I was just excited. Um, it's, when I look back on it, yeah, it's fast paced, but I would do it again mm. um, if I was still in that same position. Now with my son, that's, I mean, it's totally different. When you have a family, I think you think more about it, but when you're single, you're like, put me out there, coach. I'm ready, <laughs> ready to go, I'm ready to rock and roll. Right. Um, yeah, so I, you know, for me, it wasn't a, it was, it wasn't a big deal. It was something that I had been dreaming about the whole time. So how, did, how did you tr move to the T6 then? And also kind of cross the cross flow or cross commission. Cross, yeah. Cross well, commission. But you were in cross commission transfer. in Georgia. Right. So it's really as far as the air force in inter service transfer, how did I inter service transfer? So I mean, as you know, at the end of 2000, I was done with my fleet tour. I had finished up my second long cruise in South America. And I still, you know, I still wanted to be in, in my mind, I'm still going to be an astronaut. You know, I'm doing everything here. I'm, I got all my upgrades. I was a standy bow. I worked in standy bow. I was doing all this stuff, but I still wanted to be an astronaut. And at that time, there were not a lot of flying slots to go back fixed wing. Like you could be a T-34 instructor, but it was hard. I called up the recruiter, sorry, not the recruiter. I called up the detailer, which uh, in Air Force terms is a, you know, you're functional. Mm -hmm. Okay, so mm -hmm. I called up my detailer and I go, hey, do you that, have any job? For the real world, the, that's someone in charge of your assignment, your next move. Yeah, your, your next move. I apologize. Oh, you're good. Um, so someone who's in charge of my next move. And I called them up and I said, hey, I, I want to, I'm looking for a job. I think I'm possibly going to work as an instructor at the uh, uh, fleet replacement unit uh, for H60s. I believe I'm going to get a job for that. I wasn't offered it yet, but I had interviewed well. So, but I, I'm looking for something else. I want to do something different. I want to fly something different. I want to, I wanted to see how the other side lived. I'm always, I always want to do, for me growing up, I always wanted to try something different. And I said, I would love to see how another branch of service works. Um, during that time, you know, I'm a Navy Lieutenant. People talk about joint jobs. And when you're a Navy Lieutenant, you don't think so much about it. And I was like, huh, I wonder how the Air Force operates. So I was, I was, yeah, I was, I was talking to um, my detail and I said, do we, is there anything I could do, maybe work with the Air Force or do something that's joint like? And, you know, he was like, no, uh, not right now. Nothing's available. And I'm like, okay. Uh, probably about a month later, I got a call and he said, hey, 
during that time, I was having some difficulties in the squadron and I was looking to really leave. And uh, he called me up out of the blue and I'm like, hey, what's up? And he goes, hey, I got a job. He's like, I don't know what it entails, but it requires that you leave at this point and you're going to move quite a bit. It's a flying job. I'm, I can't tell you anything more because they're still in the process of making it work. Are you interested? And without even hesitating, I go, yes. Like I said, yes, I'm interested. And part of it was because I just wanted, I was tired for me to leave. And the other part was, ooh, this is something interesting. And he wouldn't have called me. There was a little bit of trust there. He wouldn't have called me to tell me this if it wasn't something that was going to be pretty decent or something. He knew me pretty well. Uh, he had just come from the community. So I said, I'll take it. And uh, he said, okay, I'll get back to you. And I think about six weeks later, uh, orders dropped for me. And then when I read the orders, I was like, oh, snap, like, this is cool. So, you know, the orders were basically, hey, you're going to go to Corpus Christi and you're going to become an instructor in the T-34. You're going to train there for a while. You're going to go to uh, Randolph, do some courseware tests go to uh, pit which is a pilot what is it um, instructor training yeah pilot instructor training thank you <laughs> you're gonna go to pit for we'll, we'll take a team on these uh <laughs> yeah thank you <laughs> acronyms, on these yeah. some of them don't gonna, don't exist anymore in here <laughs> right you're gonna go to pit for you know a year or so and then you're going to pay back by going to moody air force base as an instructor and then i called them up and i'm like Oh my gosh. And he goes, well, it's, it, it's cool because you were one of four Navy instructors that are going. And so I thought that was awesome. Um, so hence that started the whole process. So I got called in the T-34 as an instructor, got called in the T-6. And then you and I met at Moody Air Force Base. Uh, <laughs> yes. So. So, so I'm hearing a couple of things that are really important to probably your success and peace and, and, one, you're being proactive and calling, calling people, creating yes. relationships, yes. right? Like you wouldn't have gotten that had you not asked, asking for yes. what you want. Um, yes. I, I don't, th and, and even in the military, I don't think people are that proactive. I, we, a lot of times we sit back and wait and, oh, something will show up. But you created something that didn't exist just by asking for, hey, here's some things. Can you look out for me? And creating a relationship, really. Right. So um, nothing, and I'll go back to what you just said, nothing irritates me more when I talk to some young people now as a trainer, mm -hmm. and they go, I'm waiting, I'm open for what the universe presents itself. <laughs> I, I really, I really want to choke out, and I really want to physically um, harm you just for a split second, and just say, listen to what you just said. Um, because it, it doesn't work that way. You have to be, if you don't care about your life or your journey, no one else is going to care about it. We ain't mm -hmm. got time for that. You know, there are people along the way that will help you and kind of guide you, but you are in charge of it. So yes, you have to go out there and get it. It's the same way. How did I join the military in the first place in the Navy when I was in New York and every recruiter I to talked to said, we're not looking for a pilot slot. You know, the guy I was dating called a, a recruiter in San Diego. And then that my boyfriend said, hey, call this recruiter. And I called him. He said, you get out here. We'll let you take the test. If you pass it, we'll, we'll put your package in and you will have a good chance of getting a pilot slot. I mean, you just got to, if you want it bad enough, you got to do it because someone else is doing it. So right. you, ha you cannot wait for the universe. In doing, in being a person of action, the universe will talk to you. There will be more opportunities for you. Well, and I think, um, so. I love that you're saying that because I think it's that right action, right? Like in creating that and saying, this is what I wanted, right. it shows right up and you're like, like, I didn't even hesitate. That was a yes. Let me go do it. Um, right. But none of that would have existed before. And and I love that because I've been dancing and playing back and forth with that whole, I'll just see how it comes. But 
it always requires me to take the step towards it. And then, then more and more opportunities show up. So I love that. Right. It, yeah. It's a, it, I hate to, I'm not going to be geeky about it, but it's a feedback loop, right? <laughs> you got to put some stuff out there to get it back. You can't, <laughs> you can't just be in receive mode the whole time. You have to transmit something. So yeah. um, there's my dork analogy for today. Um, uh, it won't be the only one. It, that's part of your charm. <laughs> And that's part of your term is the geekiness and bringing it down to earth. <laughs> because, because I think part of what I enjoy just hanging out and talking with you is, and just being around you is like, there's that down to earth part too, right? Like you've had just an amazing opportunity life. This is, and, and we'll get to the you two after, but you bring it down to earth in a no nonsense way. Um, I want, I, so I told you I was going to bring up these stories at Moody. So I don't remember the first time I met you. But I'm sure it was cool. I mean, it was just uh, probably, no big, <laughs> probably no big deal, right? <laughs> but well, go ahead. Well, the cool, the the funny thing, we were the only two, were we the only two women instructors? Uh, three. Uh, uh, there was uh, Western, West, a gal I really didn't know. She was there for a little bit. Yeah. In so, e or something. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we're no. the only two girls there, which... <laughs> We probably should have hung out more, but, um, but the, and so that, that job is a 12 hour job and you're on different cycles depending on the flights you're in. Um, right. and one of the things that I loved about you, it, well, and we'll probably get more into the, with the Navy and Air Force talk, but something that's really awesome with you is like personal accountability and you deal with things right there. And so one of the coolest stories, Meryl stories, is you walking in and grabbing my, one of my students who I'm debriefing. He was on a solo flight, so it meant he went out by himself, so I'm just debriefing, did, did everything go all right? And you were apparently in the RSU, which was, you monitor the whole pattern, and my student made what, some- So wait, wait, R, wait, wait, RSU, Runway Supervisory Unit? Yep. So, okay. so you're the, yeah, you're the control tower for our local pattern. So you're telling everyone mm -hmm. what to do. And, um, apparently my student made some bozo student move and you came in and, and your repercussion or not it wasn't repercussion. It was just push-ups, and I'll let you talk about why or, or how, but that's actually something that we don't do in the air force. So I love the different culture ways that the Navy just handles things and the Air Force is maybe a little more kinder, gentler. But my, my poor student was looking at me like, I'm not doing this. And my, all I said to him was, you better get down there. and Because <laughs> <laughs> you could out push up any guy in, our, in the unit. Um, but I'm like, nope, I would listen to, to you. <laughs> She's your boss right, right. now. <laughs> it was it was cool because he was looking to me like, oh, I can't even. Incredible. He, he, he was looking for looking like, help me. <laughs> he was looking for a lifeline. Right. I'm like, no <laughs> lifeline here. <laughs> You're like, I'm just gonna hold on to this donut right the, here. I'll get the story later. <laughs> you probably don't remember that kid because I did pass you doing a lot of push-ups with people. So, what? <laughs> What was, what was your thinking behind that? And what, so, yes, yeah, so the, the, yeah, the Navy, um, okay, push-ups, number one, when I was going through flight school, some instructors would have students do push-ups. It, it was just one of those things. If you screwed up, depending on what your relationship with your uh, instructor was, the ongoing that we called. But what I, I liked about push-ups is that it's quick, it's on the spot, you're done. And the Navy, in my opinion, when it comes to, in my humble opinion, when it comes to disciplining um, at times, depending on the severity, you have buffoonery, right? So you have little minor things. The Navy is really big on addressing it right there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you may get a call sign out of it. Um, you, you know, you may have to stand up in front of your peers and talk about it and talk about what you did wrong and what you could have done better. And then when it's done, it's done. You know, people forget about it. 
if unless you have a call sign and then they go about their day in the air force it always seemed like if you made a mistake man people would hold that over your head as small as it may be for a very long time yep. and i i found that interesting in a not so great way because as students you're supposed to make mistakes mm -hmm. you're you're going to make mistakes you're going to you're going to make mistakes as a young officer you're you know your job is to learn and you have to be there has to be a, a lesson learned out of it but there also has to be some forgiveness and i thought the navy uh was just a little more forgiving so push-ups for me meant as an instructor one uh, if i gave them to you it's probably because you missed some attention to detail and um whether even by my voice or maybe if your voice is a little bit deeper and you walk in the halls and you call me sir because there's so many men there and you're not paying attention that I'm a female, you're getting 10 push-ups. Um, <laughs> if, you know, if you're in the pattern and you break and you forget to make a call and I catch it, you're doing 10 push-ups. Mm -hmm. If you are, if I hear you on the radios doing something buffoonerous, you're going to get it. I, um, I don't, you know, some people said, uh, they've been zero ground hook in the air force. Like they were doing some pre-flight or doing something and they got hooked, which means they failed the flight and right. they had to go back. If it's your first, you know, your first solo and you're not doing anything that's a safety violation, but you're just being a little bit buffoonerous. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I may click on the radio. You owe me 10. So it reminds them, Hey, I need to pay attention because other people here are watching me. Mm -hmm. and they're seeing what I'm doing. And because I'm soloing, it's not time for me to become complacent. And that's, that's why, um, that's why that happened. But it was, it was one of those that was, it was a little humorous, maybe not for the person involved doing the push-ups. Right. But it was also just well, as a reminder to everyone because it, else. Well, it takes a certain amount of, um, I don't know, cojones to walk into another flight and have, call out that student, right? Like, and that's what I appreciate too, is like, where's white, right? Like, yeah, you just, <laughs> oh, but, son, what did you do? What happened? <laughs> <laughs> but it was going to be good. <laughs> and I don't even I mean, remember what it was, but it was, I, I do appreciate that and the cultural difference. And, and I don't know, I think coming from a woman too, of no, let's just take care of it now. I, I, I do think there is, uh, you know, being a woman, I think sometimes we don't take care of things right away. And I think that's a, a culture that's beneficial. I don't, I don't know if you've noticed that or certainly, I, I think, go ahead. Yeah, I think um, overall, sometimes, and, and women just in the, in an environment, a working environment, may not be as assertive as, like say I am. Uh, we, we just talked about it before we hit record that there are times now when I'm a personal trainer, if there's something that someone says, I will immediately just go, well, what did you mean by that? And then they might be taken aback, like, well, why are you calling me out on something that I'm passively saying? And I'm just like, you know, they don't say it in that manner, but I'll just look at them and go, well, what do you mean? And then we'll, like, we'll address it. And I don't mean it to be harsh but they may take it as military Merrill's out and <laughs> taking care of business, but it's, it's not, I think we need to be a little bit more upfront and a little bit more honest with one another. And it's no hard feelings. It's not, it's not personal. It's just, Hey, let's just, let's talk about it. And then we walk away feeling good. And, and I do appreciate you pointing that out, that difference between the air force and the Navy. It, I mean, it definitely is true. Um, and I don't know how many times throughout my career I was trying to create ways um, not to be top cover, but it definitely as a flight commander, it was, you will always come and tell to me what happened right away. Don't right. let me find out from the top down. Cause I can't, I can't talk about it. Right. And, and if I found out about it, then I could present it as a way of, yep, this is what we did. This is our thing. Here's the deficiency in training. We'll do it. And then, Mutley's a great example. Walk into Mutley's office. We love to like yell at you, right? Like that was his yes. tactic. And it's like, yes, we did this. I'm well aware of it. Here's how we're going to handle it. Like, it would just completely defeat the sales. Um, 
but recognizing like we had all young instructors after a certain point that they have to learn too. they have to own up to their mistakes. They have to create an environment where it's not going to be held over them forever. And I think right. that definitely is a cultural thing in the air force, which I'm not sure how that developed or why, but it's not beneficial. No, I, I, yeah, I don't. And remember when I first started there at uh, Moody, I worked for um, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Senna at the time. So over at the TRIZ, the Training Readiness Support Squadron, I was yep. a Navy liaison officer. And um, Colonel Senna, his nickname was Dog for a reason. I mean, he was, he was, uh, he was very, I don't know, rough around the edges like he I used to laugh and say you're a marine in air force clothing because <laughs> you know he would put a dip in his mouth uh during meetings and just let people have it but in our office you know he was he was so in, like his personality was so endearing to me because he'd curse you out or he'd curse um he'd dip he would do all these things that were not air force but then when it came outside of his organization, man, he'd protect you. Mm -hmm. But if you did something wrong in his, in his office, he'd be straight shooter with you. And he would, he would take a shovel and get to digging in you if uh, you did something wrong. But then he, you, you learn your lesson and then he'd go out and, and be helpful. So um, I kind of, that was more to me, Navy-esque and mm -hmm. more endearing quality. And I enjoyed I was glad he was my first um, boss in the Navy, uh, yeah, as a Navy instructor in Air Force Base, because it made it uh, a little bit more easy to transition to. Mm. And uh, he kind of talked me into eventually switching over to the Air Force. Um, he, you know, he started talking about programs because he knew I was getting out. So uh, he said, why don't you come over? He's like, Meryl, come over. Like he's all gruff and I'm like, hmm. Mm -hmm. See. Right. Yeah. Uh, another relationship, right? That opened up more doors. Um, yes. So, how did you handle, or you know, you're instructing students going out solo for their first time? How do you get comfortable with? It's it's almost in a way like a really short, I don't know, child rearing time, right? Like you're teaching them, and then you're like, get out of the nest. Right, so uh, as an instructor teaching new students, um, it's almost like a, an exercise in let's go up and let's see if you remember what you're supposed to do. And in the process, I'm trying to prevent you from killing us. And, you know, we'll try to, you'll try to glean some knowledge during that, especially the first couple of flights. I mean, there's been some wild times. There was never a point that I was ever comfortable with a student. <laughs> Because <laughs> I, I think at one point, even even I was coming back from a, a flight with a student, and it was so benign. And then he saw a bird, a turkey buzzard of all things. You know, turkey buzzards, when they see a plane, the first thing they do is dive. Well, he takes the aircraft and puts it in a negative situation and dives down with it. And... Uh, yeah, because I've been in these situations. It means you, once you get comfortable with a student, maybe you don't strap yourself in as hard. <laughs> and so when you're in a negative situation, your whole body is up towards the canopy away from the controls while your <laughs> student is is killing you a thousand feet off the ground. <laughs> like, yes. So I mean, not we killing you, in, but <laughs> but we were in the pattern. Uh, we were coming back in the pattern. So we were about a thousand feet. So there's not and there's trees in Georgia. <laughs> so there's not much out. I was, I was, uh, upset. I was, I was a little upset about that. Um, I had some choice words for the student. <laughs> Actually, I, I, I would usually have said something a lot more, uh, a lot more, uh, direct, but I, I took the controls and thought about it and I go, well, uh, yeah, you're not passing this ride. That's, I said something <laughs> to that effect. And I, and I, uh, you know, cause I was in shock. I was just like, how dare you? do this I was insulted I was like we just had a we just had an okay flight it was an average flight he was a struggling student and I was like why 
like in my mind, what? You know, I'm still, I'm still back there with the turkey buzzer. We're looking eye to eye. Like I could see details <laughs> of the bird. <laughs> the turkey buzzer is like, this is not the approved solution. <laughs> <laughs> You're supposed to go up. I go down. <laughs> yeah. And then I looked at, I was, I was just talking to Stu. I'm like, yeah, I remember saying I took the controls. I was like, I have the aircraft. And I go, yeah. I just said, yeah. Uh, yeah, you're not passing this ride. Like I just, I don't usually tell a student that in right? that case, but I was, I was really angry about that. I think that was the second time I ever said that to a student in flight and the, the other student, he was so nervous that he did everything wrong from going out of the area to doing things at low altitude. And finally I said, look, you failed. Now, can we take a deep breath? Can we just fly the rest of the flight? And then he did it perfectly. And I'm like, why? <laughs> He was so bottled up. I was right. like, I was like, I can't pass. <laughs> now go have fun. <laughs> yeah, I said, take a deep breath. Now let's learn. And he was like, and I'm like, why'd you fly like this? The well, first quarter of this book was a mess. And that's the hard thing to explain to people because, you know, students after their first ride, they just have their, they just have a simulator, which the simulator for the T6 is really awesome. But, um, it is. but it's still, it's not fine. And so first you know, first two or three flight students, they just do things that you have no concept that they would do. Um, when you're, my, I know about the roller coaster negative experience because mm -hmm. I was flying a, a dollar ride, the first ride with a student. And as instructors, we always give it to them all trimmed up, like, which means you don't even have to touch the controls, the plane will fly itself. And so yes. it's like, okay, are you ready? And it's like, yes, ma'am. Well, okay, cool. You have the aircraft. And he just took it. And like, I've never understood what this expression <laughs> meant until he did it. But meat for hand, like cement hands. He just meat hooks. Meat <laughs> hooks. Like, you know, all it had to do was carry this attitude. And he just, <sighs> okay, I need to strap myself in more. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, let go. <laughs> You're like, I'm not having fun right now. <laughs> this is not how it's going to go. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, they just have a, don't have a concept. And you don't have a concept for what they're going to do, right? Like, it's fun. No. It's, it, but it's really fun to see three, four weeks later, they're out the door doing this all by themselves. It, it is. It's, um, it, it's a good feeling because uh, it's like you imprinted – in the DNA sense, your technique or your flying technique on them. And you've, mm -hmm. you've influenced them in some way. You've built some type of foundation that they just can't get rid of. I mean, I had, you know, I fast, when I was instructed there, fast forward to 2012, 2013, my first solo student, uh, Ensign Thomas Nagy, saw him walk in NORAD Northcom building you know, in his suit, because now he's, you know, he's a contractor and he's working with some three-letter agency. And he sees me and it's just like, you know, I was like, like a proud mom, like, oh, you've grown up so great. You know, was, <laughs> you know, you know, in some way he smiles and we smile because you know that, you know, there was this teacher-student relationship that you have you know, you've given them something, whether it be good or bad, they have right. something that you've taught them. <laughs> they have something that you've taught them and um, they've taken something away. So uh, it's, it's, a, it's a good thing. That's so cool. So now <laughs> move on, like how do you get into YouTube world? Because that's just, like that's not even on my radar. We're, I think you and I grew up in a, a time of flying where we were kind of lucky because at least on the Air Force side, everyone before was in a plane and that's what they flew for their whole career. Looking back, I wanted to be the person who flew a bunch of different planes and I got to fly five different aircraft while I was in the military, which yeah. is pretty, pretty lucky. Um, right. But you starting off in the Navy helicopter, now you're getting to do probably as close to an astronaut well, you are an astronaut. Tell me, tell me. <laughs> Only immensely. Did you wear a Star Trek um, badge? <laughs> yes. No. Um, oh, I so, wore my Halloween Star Trek shirt. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
so I knew coming out of the Navy, when I was done and my fleet tour with the Navy, I knew that I, I probably would not make it to test pilot school in the Navy. Um, and I knew that wasn't going to happen. So when I was at Moody and my time was up, so I was around the 10 year mark, my commitment was up. Uh, I, I actually put in a resignation of my commission. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about, okay, I still want to become an astronaut. So how am I going to get there? Okay, I got to go back to school. I'm going to have to get a degree, get a PhD. So I'm mentally starting to shift my gears to academia as much as, you know, I love flying, but I was like, I, I want to be an astronaut. And when I had the, the talk with Dog and Chell, who's now my husband, who's my boyfriend at the time, he says he told me about the YouTube prior, but I ignored him. I go, well, I said, you probably did, but you know, I said, no offense, but as a non-aviator, you know, you're not going to be apt to listen to someone. <laughs> so I tell him, you probably said it, and I, it went like through one ear out the other. But as, as Dog was talking to me, he said, hey, maybe F-117, which was around at the time, you know, B-52s and U-2s. And I started looking at the U-2. And I started looking at the program and what they did. And I was, what I, I liked about, there was a couple of things I liked about it. Um, single seat, flying by myself. I, I don't mind that. It's awesome. Uh, it was pressure suit, spacesuit, similar spacesuits that NASA astronauts wear. High altitude, which I'm looking at all these things that could be put on a resume for me as a non-test pilot person to be desirable for NASA. What are those things that are going to make me stand out? At the time, we didn't have a definition for it, but now we talk about branding yourself. How do you brand yourself as someone that's different? So I was thinking that without saying those words. Mm -hmm. So how do I make myself more interesting to look at from a, a resume standpoint? And the U2 just seemed to fit the bill. And when I went out there, I actually did a cross country with, um, I don't remember, at that time I was working in Seaflight as a scheduler. So um, I, was, I went on a cross country with, a, his name was Dave. I don't remember his last name. We went out to Beale to check it out and just to get an idea. And I wanted to talk to some of the pilots out there. And when we got out to Beale and I saw how they dead it out like they did in helicopters, how the mission was reconnaissance, like I did some things in the Hilo community. No weapons, of course. I was like, heck yeah, I want to go into this community. Like it, it felt like a brotherhood of people that I can deal with, like being on the boat. So I said, okay, let me put in my package. So that just took a, there were two things I had to do, put in my YouTube package because I had the hours. So I did so. I also had to put an inter-service transfer request in because I was currently in the Navy to the Air Force. They came back and said I had um, a separation number because I resigned my commission. I had to put in another letter on the Navy side to say, um, you know, I vacate that. I, I don't want to resign my commission. So that's, that happened. I talked to my detailer or my functional or my assignments person at the time and said, hey, can you extend me for this amount of time to the end of the year because I, uh, I'm applying for the YouTube program and I would really appreciate it if I did not separate at this point. Mm -hmm. So the, the detailer looked at me and he looked at, you know, he's typing on his computer and he goes, yeah, he's like, I don't even, you know, you're not really in, you're in the system, but we don't have you, you know, progged for anything. So he's like, sure, well, well, you could stay there. And I'm like, awesome. So um, at that point, I, I put in my inner service package, my YouTube package. The YouTube community comes back to me and says, you know, congratulations, you have an interview. So I'm like, great. AFPC, which is Air Force Personnel Center, when I put my inner service package in, they come back and say, thanks for your interest in the Air Force, but we can't accept your application in the Air Force. You know, we don't have any slots. So I call up AFPC and I said to them, hey, uh, 
I know you just denied me and you just said thanks, but no thanks, but the YouTube community has given me an interview. So, you know, the lady had some things to say about <laughs> your YouTube brethren, my YouTube brethren. And she goes, okay, if you pass the YouTube interview, you know, we'll accept you into the Air Force. And I go, okay, great. And uh, then the rest is history. I went out there for the two week interview. I got hired, came back and, that, that was it. And then we just had the, we actually had to start the dates in terms of when am I going to transition over to the Air Force? When am I going to uh, PCS over to the Air Force? And I kind of, you know, it was an administrative piece. So I had to work that with both Navy side with my detailer, AFPC, and kind of end on the Navy one day. And then the next day I would, you know, PCS out to Beale Air Force Base. Nice. So I remember going from student pilot to the first time I pushed up the engines on the bigger KC-135. Right. What's it like flying the, it's a rocket basically, right? Yes. It's um, GE engine, 17,000 pounds thrust, maybe a max power. So There's your geek. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> Beep boop. Um, so how does it feel? My first experience flying the U-2, taking off, was it, was, it was crazy, the sensation of it, because it doesn't, you have this jet, you know, you're sitting on this, this jet, basically, it, it doesn't move like a T-38 does, like a T-38 is, how can I explain it? When you go up in a U2, it's more of a, this elevator escalator ride as soon as you hit the speed. Like the T38, it's a nice, easy transition. But the U2, as soon as you get off the ground, you need to put it about 20, 30 degrees nose up, or you're going to overspeed it. So the sensation is just very quick to take off. So it was almost like being in an escalator, but moving at elevator speeds. It's just a very quick climb. And then you look back and you're already at three to 5,000 feet. It doesn't take very long. So uh, the sensation was just a little bit, it wasn't disconcerting. It was just like, huh, that's, this is weird. So uh, you, you got to get used to it a couple of times because you want to push the nose over, but you can't, you, I mean, you can't, push it over like you would in the 38 you'll overspeed the aircraft like no one's business so and, you can't do that and that plane requires a lot of attention to detail like it, you're flying right on the edges of its performance you are so you're you're right you know you're a few knots from stalling the aircraft to a few knots to overspeeding the aircraft and you need to stay in that sweet spot and, and the higher you go the smaller the margin becomes so I have two questions. Well, probably more. What's it like when you first reach that curvature of the earth spot? My first high flight in the U-2 was, uh, it, I mean, it was exhilarating. It was, you know, you see on that day, other than the fact that my canopy was iced up because I was breathing so hard because you're just like so pumped. Um, so my breathing rate was just out of control. You're just, you're not calm. Everyone thinks they're going to be calm in their first high flight. No, you're just breathing. You're breathing harder than you normally would anywhere. I, I think it was every time I went up at altitude and started seeing the curvature and started seeing the, the sky turn darker. It just, I've said it before, you feel so small in the whole scheme of life. Mm. It's just a very surreal picture. Um, it's, you know, just knowing that you're higher than most people and you see things that most people will never see in their lifetime is amazing. And it makes you appreciate life and it makes you appreciate your position. And it makes you appreciate the fact that any drama you have is so small in comparison to what's out there. So it's, yeah, it's, it's a great feeling. I, I never 
took for granted every time I'd go up, whether it was day or night. Um, nights I used to love or when you would transition from, uh, when you're going from sunset to twilight mm -hmm. and you start seeing all these stars that are obstructed, that are not obstructed by uh, lighting pollution. It's phenomenal. I mean, it's, it's crazy. There are, there are times in when I was, uh, I was uh, the commander at Palmdale and we would do, um, we would test sensors early in the morning, wee hours in the morning, like two, three, four o'clock in the morning. And it's just so peaceful. It's mm -hmm. crazy. So uh, yeah, I enjoyed it quite a bit. That's so cool. That was one of my perspectives, I think, in Afghanistan. Like at 50,000 feet, even Afghanistan is beautiful. Like, yes, you just get to see mother nature and how powerful. And we flew over this one spot where like the desert was creeping up a mountain and those mountains aren't small. Like we're not saying a hill. It's, you can see the desert moving up the mountain and just, and it's gorgeous. And then you get down into the storm and then it, <laughs> then it's, then it's not, but <laughs> yeah, when you're above there, and I, I mean, the closest I compare, because we were at 50,000 feet hour max, and looking out at night at the stars, and it's incredibly gorgeous. It, it's beautiful. Um, I, yeah, I just, I, I love it. So I was, before we, you know, before we talked, I was thinking about it. Yeah, it's just, it's a beautiful sight. Um, there's a, one of the YouTube pilots, uh, um, Ross Frankemont, Extreme Ross, he has taken some video footage of some of the YouTube sites that are just beautiful. I should have been more of a camera person now, but I'll just, <laughs> I'm just going to plagiarize all his, his works. I'm like, there send you me go. your pictures. You <laughs> so, so we talked about, oh, it's got to be really quiet too, right? Is it yeah, really so peaceful? You don't hear the engine back there in the once you're at altitude or? So you do hear it's very hard in the, in the helmet. Mm -hmm. So you lose a lot of sensation. You know, you're not, you're not smell, you can't smell. Mm -hmm. Tactile feel because of the gloves are very poor. So it's hard to grab stuff. When you listen, listening in the cockpit, you'll hear yourself breathing because mm -hmm. you're pressure breathing. You'll hear the light hum of the engine if everything is okay. So that's about it. You don't, I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty quiet, except for your breathing. You do sound like Darth Vader. Yeah. And your missions are can be pretty long. I know we can't talk about all the things you do. Right. They, so yeah. So they my so missions. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I said missions um, lasted at least during the times I flew anywhere from eight hours to over ten. So how do you maintain your focus? how do you train yourself for a focus like that? And how do you maintain it when you're flying within really small margins, you're by yourself? Right, so one of the things, I mean, we have an autopilot up there because you can't hand fly that for that long a period of time. Maintaining your focus, you just, you have a, you establish a routine. So, you know, for me, I wouldn't, you know, we transit, you do all your check-ins. The first, the first four hours, I wouldn't eat anything. But at that fourth hour, I would have my vegetarian pasta. I think I'm the only one in the YouTube community that ever ate vegetarian pasta. I would have my vegetarian pasta and my caramel pudding. And then I would probably pop some go gel in the, in the middle of that if I knew it was a long flight. Then fast forward, then I would always drink, I would always drink about, I would always have maybe eight bottles of water. So about every hour I needed to finish at least three quarters to a one full bottle because you got to stay hydrated and it's easy to not be hydrated. So I would make sure that those things were happening. Um, I would also make sure that I would do my checks that I needed to do at specific times. Every hour on the hour, you have the mission on team commander, the, the mock who'd call you. And I tell him, first of all, I tell him, don't speak to me. Like, I, I, not being rude or anything. I just like, unless there's some emergency, don't talk. Let me hear the radios. Let me talk to uh, any troops in contact or anything. But every hour, you know, call me with, uh, 
you know, something funny, like give me a joke or give me a random fact, <laughs> some random factoid that you looked up. So that's what they would do. So you just, ha you had this particular routine. Now everyone's routine is different, mm -hmm. but I, I would just establish a routine that would get me through. So it's, I find it interesting now because of COVID and we have all this self quarantine and people are frustrated and, and losing their minds. And I just laugh and they go, well, Mara, how are you dealing with it? I go, first thing we did with my son, he's on a routine. He gets up every morning at seven, between seven and 7.30. By eight o'clock, he's downstairs eating breakfast. 8.30, we start our homeschool, period. And uh, when he gets up in the morning, he will, you know, he makes his bed, he does all these other things. And then when he does his work, he gets a snack at like, I, I think 9.30, 10, finishes up, then he gets to watch. And it's, it's worked well. Um, because, you know, I heard some other people who had kids and they were like, well, the kids get up at 9.30. I'm so bored. And I'm like, how could you be bored? I said, and I look at them, I go, man, I spent hours on an aircraft by myself, peeing on myself. Do you think I'm allowed to walk on the ground, go to a store with a mask on, and you're bored? Like, this is, this is my highlight. I'm just right. chilling. It's, well, it's awesome. I was going to ask, how do you, because you're eight, eight hours plus in your own thoughts. You're, you're just hanging with yourself, right? I mean, you've got your routines, you've got your things, but this is still here. How, how, do, how besides routine, what else do you help? people who maybe this is the first time they've been quiet in their own world these last few months. Well, I, I would say congratulations with being with yourself. And um, <laughs> seriously, I, I think if anyone should know you well, it should be you. So mm -hmm. explore that, explore, explore your thoughts, explore those deep things that you keep pushing on the wayside to do work. Uh, when you're going to work or something, or you're hanging out with your friends, um, I enjoy. I, I enjoy the quiet time. I enjoy, but I'm that type of per. I'm that type of person who. I critique myself daily on a daily basis. So I. I'm always, I like to say, very reflectful or introspective on the things that I do. Um, there are, even when I go on bike rides, you know, I'm thinking about, I'm thinking about the future. I'm thinking about the current events that are going on. I'm thinking about everything from what my son is doing to um, what's going on in CNBC to, I, I try not to think about a lot of political things, but I just think about the here and now. Um, and people should do more of that. Spending more family time. At that time, I didn't have a family, but um, it wouldn't be unusual if I can write some notes down on my paper, you know, on my board, if I'm flying, if I was thinking about something, if there was some quiet time. Um, some people would take books up there. Occasionally, I would do it when I had Air Command and Staff College. I might have to have a couple of notes to study. Uh, but yeah, I like, I mean, I like the person that I am. So I don't, I don't mind being in my thoughts. I don't mind talking to myself going, hey, Meryl, that's insane. Like, I'll say it out loud. <laughs> <laughs> that was a crazy, you know, that's, what are you thinking right now? So I don't mind it. But I, I was raised single family household, only child, you know, it's. So you've been entertaining um, yourself your whole life. I, I have been. So, I mean, I'm a latchkey kid. You give me a cardboard box and a crayon, I'll be good for a week. So, <laughs> <And> snacks. <laughs> It's, give me some snacks, some water. I'm good. That was uh, one of my favorite memes for this whole li lifetime is like Generation X. Like, we've been preparing for this our whole life. <laughs> Bring it. There, there, <laughs> there, was another, there was another meme that had Kermit. And they go like uh, civilians or people in COVID and had Kermit like his hands waving. And then it said military people and, and Kermit's like sitting in a chair with a drink he's just chilling and I'm like it's it's a hundred percent if you've I, I think for people who have been in situations where it's highly stressful where you're in a foxhole 
or I, you know, I remember one time I'm sitting on the boat with, uh, you know, your chem mask on waiting. Oh, oh yeah. Right. Yeah. And you're sitting there quietly waiting for impending doom, or you're sitting in an aircraft by yourself, or you're with a, you know, a group of five people in an aircraft, you know, crew, and you're entertaining yourself. It's, it's easier for us. We know how to deal with it. We felt that feeling before. We felt that frustration, sometimes that isolation. And uh, we're, we're able to deal with it better than, you know, your normal, not normal, but your, your folks that have not been in those environments. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. clearly, we're go this is going to be a long interview. Do you have time to oh, stay? Because we haven't even hit, we haven't even hit the questions we talked about. <laughs> So I think what it, this is probably going to be a two-part thing. So what I'll do is I'll, okay. I'll stop the recording. Thank okay. you for listening. And we're going to hit some really cool subjects after, after the, in the next episode. For, please look for that. See you in a bit.